you're going to get a lot of information this week. Uh, and if you're anything like me, you're going to forget most of it. But uh, hope I, what I hope you take away from this, at least, are the people, um, who we are, what we're doing, and where to go to find what you need as you get into your uh, graduate experience at Stanford. So what we're going to spend the next 45 minutes talking about is, well, it, it, I hope you will uh, have answered by the end of the next 45 minutes, what is clean energy finance? What, who does it on campus, and where can I find out more? Uh, so I'm, you know, think of me kind of as the orchestra leader. Uh, I'm the managing director of the new Stanford Sustainable Finance Initiative. I'm also managing director of the Steyer Taylor Center for Energy Policy and Finance. I also teach a course at the law school, which I'll make a plug for at the end. Uh, the the So Young In and Marshall Burke, who you're going to hear from next, um, they're really, they're, they're deep into the research. So they're doing the kinds of things that I'm talking about at a 30,000 foot level in the slides to come. So the way I like to introduce the concept of clean energy finance is actually a quote that Christiana Figueres uh, made at um, just following the Paris Agreements. So this was January 2016. And she said, how capital gets deployed over the next five years will determine the fate of humanity. So this is important stuff. Um, and that was two and a half years ago. So we got to get to it. One way to think about that is a measuring stick that an organization called Ceres has, has been marketing and I think to, to good effect to help people wrap their minds around the scale. What we're talking about here is to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement. That is no more than two degrees Celsius warming. We need to reach a trillion dollars of investment in clean energy globally per year over the next 15 years. There's another mile marker out there you might see of 2.3 trillion. It's effectively double. That accounts for low carbon uh, at sources of energy, effi energy efficiency, um, and transmission, et cetera. So there are other sources that come, there are other um, inputs that go into that number. It starts on a higher base. At the end of the day, we're still talking about three times more investment than current spend in deploying proven technologies of today, developing innovative technologies and business models of the future, and scaling economically or politically challenged technologies. So at the Sustainable Finance Initiative, our approach is to actually reframe climate in order to move capital at that requisite speed and scale. And I sort of borrowed a little bit from Dr. Seuss and the in-out list, so bear with me if this is too cute for you. But we're moving from price to risk, so out, pricing carbon, in, pricing risk. From micro to macro, out, cool demonstration projects, in, changing production systems. From there to here, out, global solutions in local solutions. And here's the Dr. Seuss part. Climate solutions are everywhere. Out, Asia as a finance and technology taker in state-driven finance. So particularly at SFI, we're thinking about both Western and state-driven financial systems. A little detour here on what centers are. You're going to hear from faculty members. You're going to hear from center directors and and. Um, I think about centers at their best as a bridge between academics and markets. So we take the resources and assets of the university, the faculty, the fellows, the graduate students, the undergraduate students, alumni, our networks, and we build bridges to the real world and get things done. A little detour on the Steyer Taylor Center because it's confusing and you'll see it on your map. Um, Steyer Taylor Center is a, a joint initiative with the business school and the law school. I am also the managing director there. The mission of the Steyer Taylor Center is to increase the cost-effective deployment of clean energy in the U.S. and globally by developing and disseminative, disseminating uh, supportive policies and financial instruments, training the next generation of leaders, and convening academic business and policy leaders. We're pretty much the same people as SFI, so you'll see most of these <coughs> names and faces again. Paul Brest, former dean of the law school, is the acting executive director. Thomas Heller, uh, who is my the faculty director of SFI, is also the interim faculty director of the Steyer Taylor Center. I serve the same role in both uh, places. And here are some of our fellows. Um, there, there are more. Uh, coming back to the, the Stanford Sustainable Finance Initiative, our mission is, if you look at the Venn diagram, effectively encompasses Steyer Taylor, but is broader in a, in a sense that it's looking to develop um, system-transforming policy 
business and finance solutions across energy, agriculture, and mobility. So we're really looking at the decarbonization and climate resilience more broadly. A little bit of who we are. Again, Tom Heller, uh, managing, uh, excuse me, faculty director. I'm the managing director. We've got an advisory board of which Sally Benson is the chair. We've brought in the first four folks. This will expand. Richard Kaufman, the New York State Energy Czar. Uh, Joaquin Levy, who's managing director at the World Bank. Jeffrey Greener, who's the chief risk officer at Bank of America. Bank of America is the benefactor of the Sustainable Finance Initiative. Uh, and then we, the, the initial team of researchers includes Girish Shramali, Uday Vardarjan, So Young In, who you'll hear from, Stephen Camello. I would love to add Marshall Burke to this list at some point. This was the assumptive close by bringing him in today. Um, and just a brief detour into our focus areas. So within that broad mission of, of um, transforming systems, we're approaching it across business and financial innovation. So these are the new business models, financial vehicles, blended capital strategies, green bonds, uh, all of which you know, have the pursuit of catalyzing private investment at scale. Second focus area is around risk metrics and management. So this, again, is this idea for moving from pricing carbon to pricing risk. And because we're here at Stanford, no initiative can, um, can exist without including the application of big data analytics. But in this sense, it is, it is truly exciting to think about combining climate models with the capabilities of big data analytics to yield investment-ready uh, analysis to help asset owners redeploy assets based on appropriately pricing the climate risk. Managing stranded assets, so designing innovative vehicles and financial mechanisms to um, compensate for just transitions. And then transforming and integrating legacy systems, so new political and economic me mechanisms for integrating resource-efficient technologies into an infrastructure across energy, agriculture, and mobility, those legacy systems. A little bit of a diagram here to show you the model of how SFI is going to work. So not only do we have an ambitious mission, but we have an ambitious vision for how we're going to execute that through this, what we call an engine. So at the core, SFI is its directors, its advisors, its fellows, student engagement, and key collaborators that will in turn um, determine a suite of projects chosen based on their uh, uh, criteria whereby Stanford analysis would be valuable in the consideration of the solution set, where there are, uh, we've got clients here, but you can think of them as partners where they're situated in specific geographies with specific problems, where there's an implementation pathway. And together we can kind of crank that engine of SFI into these site-specific projects, out, the output of which will be research and analysis, meetings and workshops, internships and fellowships for folks like you, uh, new vehicles and alliances, and executive education. A little plug for the class before we get to So Young and Marshall. So uh, I'm teaching a course this winter uh, it's listed at the law school. Uh, it, it counts for the um, uh, CSI at the GSB, the um, Center for Social Innovation credit or certificate. Uh, it's called Climate, Politics, Finance, and Infrastructure. I taught it last winter with Tom Heller. I'm teaching it this winter with a woman named Kate Gordon, who was uh, the uh, lead author on the Risky Business Report, uh, which you may be familiar with, which was a risk analysis of the U.S. economy and then went into different regional uh, risk analyses of the U.S. economy. So uh, the themes we'll be exploring there are the economics and psychology of climate, kind of take you through uh, the history of climate negotiations past, looking, taking deep dives into risk management and disclosure, uh, looking at growth uh, and innovative investment models. These are some of the speakers we hope to have in the, in the next quarter, although again now Kate, who was a speaker last year, will now be a co-teacher this year. So I hope to see some of you there. Uh, and just finally, now you know who I am and where I sit on campus and what I do. I'm a connector. I like to put good people and good ideas together to make things happen. So if you remember nothing else from this, just know when you have questions around where is climate sustainable finance on campus, come find me. And with that, we'll get into the deeper dives on some research. Thank you. Nice to be here. I think I spoke at this event last year, and maybe there was half as many folks. So it's the, the growth is uh, exponential, I guess, which is exciting. Um, so I'm Marshall Burke. Uh, I think, as you've probably learned so far, 
anyone at Stanford is obligated to have like six affiliations. A lot of things to keep track of. So my departmental home is in a department called Earth System Science, which is an interdisciplinary department. Most of us sit uh, just across the breezeway there in, in Y2E2. Uh, and it's a mix of social and natural scientists, sort of heavy on the natural science. I'm one of the few social scientists there. Um, but a lot of folks thinking about problems like this from the research side, really trying to understand um, questions of climate, both from the, the physical perspective uh, as well as from the socioeconomic perspective. Uh, and so that's where my research is. Um, a lot of it tries to think about what are uh, really the benefits of climate mitigation, either locally or globally, and, and trying to think about the benefits across a suite of outcomes that we care about. Uh, everything from human health to aggregate economic output. And I'll show you a little bit of a, a, a taste of, of the sort of things we work on. Um, okay, so here's sort of the biggest picture economic framing. So my PhD is in economics. A few social scientists uh, raise your hands uh, when Alicia asked earlier, so that's too bad. Um, <laughs> but I got my PhD in economics, and so I think at this, I, I come at this uh, from an economic lens, but again, in this sort of interdisciplinary environment, so I, I, try to, I try to talk the talk. Um, so as an economist, should we imagine a government considering a specific mitigation policy? Uh, you know, uh, many examples out there, you've probably already talked about a, a lot, just in any policy. Um, the economic reasoning behind this policy, uh, or, or, or the economic reasoning behind the government's decision to adopt the policy, often boils down to something that is looks something like this, the only equation I'll show you, uh, but something about the difference between the costs and the benefits, right? So imagine a policy that's gonna cost a lot now, but generate some future stream of benefits. Uh, as a policymaker, you might be interested in adopting that policy, so here we're ignoring the, any sort of political constraints here, but from an economic perspective, you might be interested in adopting that policy if the long run discounted benefits of, of adoption and implementation uh, outweigh the cost, right? So if the left-hand side of that equation is larger than the right-hand side of the equation, right? So a lot of important things here, right? Number one is the discount rate. That's the sort of delta term. How much are you going to discount a future cost or a future benefit, right? Um, and then what are these benefits and what are the costs? So a lot of my research focuses on what's the left-hand side of that, of that equation, this benefit stream. So if we adopt some of these policies that reduce future warming, for instance, what are going to be the benefits, again, either locally or globally, on all sorts of outcomes uh, that we like to think about? Okay, so my research really tries to, to answer that question, which is fundamentally a forward-looking question, right? What's going to happen in the future if we uh, reduce the amount of warming that we're likely to see? So that's a forward-looking question. Um, to understand that, my research really tries to look backwards, actually, and use history as a laboratory to try to understand, okay, over the past few decades, past century, um, how have outcomes that we're interested in responded to past changes in climate, past changes in warming or, or precipitation patterns, right? The idea here being that, you know, history can provide hopefully some guidance as to what future impacts might look like as we run these currently fairly uncontrolled experiments with the global climate system, uh, cranking up the temperature many degrees over the next few decades. So again, uh, it's a fundamentally forward-looking question, but we use historical evidence and I'll show you pieces of this from around the world to try to get a handle uh, on, on these climate impacts questions. Okay, so let me give you three examples. Um, the first one is a really broad question. So let's say, and, and one of the key statistics we think about a lot when we're thinking about climate impacts, and if you read the IPCC reports, is it, are these aggregate economic statistics. So what's going to happen to global uh, GDP, gross domestic product, right? The value of all the things we, uh, we produce in a given year. Um, so it turns out until recently, we didn't have great evidence that directly looked at the impact of warming on that aggregate output. Instead, what we had was a lot of micro level studies that didn't look at the big picture, but they looked at lots of parts of the smaller picture, right? Uh, we looked at fundamental building blocks uh, of the economy, and we tried to add up the effects across all these building blocks to get a broader scale estimate. So here are two examples from that. This is not my own work. There's uh, other folks, and again, there, there are now literally hundreds of, of studies of this flavor. So here's one that looks at uh, labor supply. So this is literally how much people work. Um, so I'm going to show you a bunch of plots. Pretty much every plot is going to have temperature on the x-axis, some, some manipulation of temperature on the x-axis, and on the y-axis is going to be some outcome that we hopefully care about. Um, the outcomes here, uh, number one is labor supply. This is just 
how much do you work during a given day? Um, the second one is test scores. So this is, uh, I think, from SAT tests. Um, and both of these analyses, again, are looking at how these outcomes respond to changes in temperature. So lo and behold, uh, in certain jobs, this is not for all jobs. This is for, I forget the specific classification, but for people who tend to work outside more often. Um, lo and behold, when it's really hot out, people kick off from work early and go home and drink beer and sit by the pool, right? So on the hottest days, people work on average an hour less. Okay, that's, that was the sort of headline finding from this study. So labor supply goes down, at least in some industries when it's hot. Maybe no big surprise here. A lot of new studies, and, you, and apologies if you can't quite see the confidence interval on these. There are standard errors on these estimates. Um, but this study came out a few years ago. There have been a bunch of actual great studies in the last six months that have come out on this that actually shows that our cognitive function declines when it's hot. So you can see this mainly in test scores. So you can look at the, the temperature on the day of the test when kids are taking these SAT scores, uh, and it has remarkably large effects on how the kid performed uh, on that test. And it's not only the temperature on the day of the test, you can look at the accumulated temperature over the past year before the test, and that has a pretty large effect on, again, how you perform uh, on the day of the test. So repeated exposure to hot temperatures uh, reduces our cognitive function and reduces how much we learn uh, and, and how, much, how well we're able to do at the test. So if you were unlucky enough to take the SAT on a pretty hot day, so this is Celsius, so if you're used to thinking Fahrenheit, 30 Celsius is like 85 Fahrenheit, um, you were on average three percentiles lower, your math score, right? Which is like the difference between getting into Stanford and not getting into Stanford <laughs> for undergraduates. Right, so that's a big number. There's a big effect, right? Uh, and magnified across pretty much every individual who is exposed to these sorts of temperatures. Okay, so we have a lot of micro-level evidence. Again, often what policymakers are after are not the micro-level estimates, they want a macro-level estimate. What's gonna be the effect on GDP, right? This is the only thing economists care about. What's the effect on GDP? So how do we understand that? Okay, how did these studies work? They, they compared individuals exposed to hot temperatures on the day of a test to comparable individuals who are exposed to cooler temperatures on the day of the test. That's the sort of thought experiment you should have in mind. And the best studies took the same individual who happened to take the same test, so take the SAT twice. I'm sure you guys didn't retake the SAT, but I did. Um, so if you take it twice, I'm exposed likely to two different temperatures on different days, right? But it's Marshall in both settings, and the only thing that's changed likely is temperature, right? So I can compare how Marshall does on a hot day versus how Marshall does on a cool day. And those studies find something very similar, right? They find that Marshall does much better on a cooler than average day than a hotter than average day. So that's the thought experiment you should have in mind. Think of it as a sort of natural experiment that exploits variation in temperature, random day-to-day -day or year-to-year -year variation in temperature. We're gonna take that same experiment and we're gonna apply it to GDP data from countries around the world. So most countries have collected GDP data for the last half century, a system of national accounts set up after World War II, so we have pretty good data going back in time. And what we can do is do a similar experiment. So I'm gonna look at the US and I'm gonna compare output in the US in a cooler than average year to output in a warmer than average year. So I'm not going to compare the U.S. to Norway or the U.S. to Nigeria. I'm just going to compare it, it to itself in a warmer than average to a cooler than average year and ask, okay, is output higher or lower uh, as you move around the temperature, right? And we're going to do that for every single country around the world. Okay, when you do that, you get a response function that looks like this. So again, on the x-axis is annual average temperature, uh, and on the y-axis is change in the growth rate of, of gross domestic product, GDP, right? This is, again, like one of the key statistics as economists that we are on and on about. And, and there were even uh, a, a tweet storm, if you saw it this morning, about <laughs> disagreements about uh, today's GDP rate, uh, growth rate. Um, so what do we find? We find a nonlinear response function that, before I showed you this, if I just had you draw what this looks like, you probably would have drawn something similar, right? If it's really, really, really cold, imagine at the limit, right, zero Kelvin or whatever, um, <laughs> It's gonna be hard to produce anything, right? <laughs> Similarly, if it's really, really, really hot, right, middle of the Sahara, it's gonna hard, be hard to produce anything, right? So if you're really cold and you warm up the temperature, you're probably a little bit better off, up until some point where that thing turns over and then warming gets worse and worse as you approach the Sahara, right? So go from Antarctica to the Sahara, that thing has to peak somewhere, right? Turns out that's exactly what you see in the data. And where it peaks is 
Coincidence or not, hard to know exactly, 13 degrees Celsius. So what that would suggest is the global optimum temperature for producing things over the last 50 years is 13 degrees Celsius, about 55 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's an annual average temperature. One guess as to what's the annual average temperature of Palo Alto, California. <laughs> Coincidence or not, 13 degrees Celsius, right? Palo Alto is literally at the global optimum for economic output, so <laughs> you made a good choice. You made a good choice in grad school. But it turns out this is also one of the wealthiest places in the world, so coincidence or not, right? This is a very comfortable place for sort of human production, and the data bear that out. You can drop the U.S. from this regression, and you see exactly the same thing. Okay, so this is, again, backward looking. Now we're going to run the world forward and take each of these vertical slices, which, uh, which correspond to the average temperature in different countries. So the EU is a little bit left of the optimum. It turns out the U.S., Japan, China are sort of right at the global optimum right now. So the, the largest economies in the world right now are right at the global optimum. Again, unlikely to be a coincidence. Uh, and then most of the tropics are parked out here at the, at the declining part of the response function. If you don't believe the national accounts data, we've done this in household level data, we've done it in subnational data, we get the same response. So this is a very robust response. So imagine taking everyone now and cranking up the temperature slowly, one degree, two degrees, all the way up to four or five degrees with our current unmitigated climate change. What happens? Um, the point estimate is now this black line. So compare two worlds, a world in which we warm four and a half degrees by 2100 to a world in which Temperatures are fixed today. The counterfactual world is a no warming world. The difference between those two worlds is about 20% of global GDP with large uncertainty, right? So there's the sort of uncertainty bands you can see there. Uh, it turns out there's enough uncertainty in the historical relationship that we can't reject much smaller estimates, but uh, the sort of meat of the estimates here and our point estimates suggest about 20% losses in global aggregate economic output, right? Is the global number that we care about 20% relative to a non warming world, right? So this is about, so we published this in Nature a couple years ago, uh, this is about 10 times larger than the existing estimates on global economic output, right? And all we did was take history seriously, right? We said, let's look backwards and then let's use that relationship to go forward, okay? And this is pretty heroic, right? We're projecting out to 2100, so a lot of things might change about the world, right? But as sort of an initial back of the envelope, uh, it gives us pretty big numbers. So a couple more minutes. Um, I spent more time on that one example, but I like this example. Um, let me give you one more. So that's a, that's a macro level example. Again, we're doing a lot of these micro level studies and what they're useful at is, so we, we can, I can give you an aggregate picture, but it's not gonna tell us what's going on, right? So how, if we wanna shape that response, if we wanna reduce the response, given the warming we might see in the future, where would we try to do that? Where would we try to protect people from these exposures, what parts of the economy are most affected? Um, so again, there's a lot of work going on on campus on this. Happy to chat more about it if it's of interest. Something we think about a lot, particularly in the health domain, which uh, is an economically important sector, but also affects sort of each one of us every day. Um, so here's a quick pop quiz, and I'll go through this in my last couple of minutes. Um, anyone want to take a stab here? So of the top ten uh, causes of mortality in the U.S. What is, and I, here I have single, it's actually, there's two. Uh, what are the causes, or the single cause, now you're gonna have to guess which one I'm gonna talk about, but there are two causes uh, of the top 10 where mortality weights are actually not declining. So for most things, people are living longer, um, we're becoming healthier on average over time, but it, for a couple specific outcomes, that's not the case. So which are those? Yeah. Uh, drug overdose. So drug overdose is one, yeah. So that's gone up dramatically in the last couple of years. Other one? Yeah. Is it a heat-induced strokes? Uh, it's not heat-induced strokes, so those have gone up, but <laughs> thank you. Um, cardiovascular disease, uh, on, on average, uh, it has gone down over time, or, or people are living, living longer. Um, suicide. It was actually suicide. So this is something that I think has touched, I'm sure, a lot of people in the room. Um, definitely, you know, I, I've had friends uh, who have taken their own life. So this is a, it's a really serious topic. And unfortunately, suicide rates have gone up 25% in the U.S. over the last 15 years. This is something that's still not that well understood. Social scientists had noticed for over a century that suicide rates actually also peak in warmer than average months. So a lot of you might, and I had this intuition going in, so it's the darker months of winter where suicide rates are higher. That's actually not true. It's late spring and early summer, right? But it was unknown whether that was actually caused by temperature or caused by something else that varies seasonally. 
So we took the same experiment and applied it to the U.S. and Mexico. So we have tons of data in the U.S. going back almost half a century again, county level data or city level data, same thing in Mexico. Uh, and again, we're able to relate. So we're in Santa Clara County. We asked our, our suicide rates in Santa Clara County higher in months that are warmer on average. Um, and we can do that for every county in the U.S. and every municipality in Mexico. Um, and again, and the different lines here are different statistical models, happy to bore you with the details, but it does not matter how you run this analysis, you get the same response. You see this very strong upward sloping relationship between warmer than average temperatures and increases uh, in suicide rates. This is really important, and actually this paper just came out uh, about six weeks ago, and of all the papers I've ever written, this paper got more coverage in, let's call it the red state press, right? I had m way more folks from middle America interested in this paper, because this touches, I think, a lot of folks in the way that the, maybe the aggregate statistics or the sort of poor country studies do, right? This is a, has a really visceral effect on a lot of people. So let me end there. Um, a lot of really critical things to still learn about the impacts of changing climate on these outcomes we care about. I think we've learned a lot, but a lot we still need to know. Findings like this, I think, are pretty brand new. And, and I think, of course, I'm biased, but, but uh, important in sort of our understanding of the, the broader pattern of impacts that changes in climate uh, might have. So I'll stop there. Thanks.